Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 170, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And hopefully we're not sounding too tired this week, still getting over my sugar hangover from uh, getting through about four Easter eggs and a box of cream eggs last weekend. I just wait for them to go cheap and then buy them en masse. <laughs> That's the way to do it. That is so Ravi. That is so <laughs> Ravi. Now, welcome to this week's podcast. Now, we do need to get a bit of energy up because, my God, have we got a busy couple of months coming up. Summer's here, so that means... Retro gaming events. Oh, yes, events. Uh, Not across the country, across the world this time. Retro Hour goes international. Now, already this year we've done, uh, well, we started the year in Ireland, didn't we? Um, With Amiga Island. Of course, we are going to be back at Play Expo um, doing Manchester on the first Maybank holiday weekend. So we're getting all our talks and panels ready for that. Um, I'm going to be at Pixel Heaven in Poland in a couple of weeks' time as well, next month in May. And also, we are going to be hosting a couple of panels at a huge event that's going to be happening in Norway in June. Yes, we'll be going to Retro Spill Mess in 2019, so all our Scandinavian listeners come along. Now, this is going to be happening on the weekend of the 22nd and 23rd of June 2019 in Sandifjord in Norway. I hope I pronounced that right. I did a little um, pronunciation test on uh, on YouTube before, so it's probably completely got it wrong. Um, Sandy Fudd, I think we'd say in British, wouldn't we? In British English. But this is going to be happening um, right in the middle of summer, you know, end of June. And this is, I mean, we've chatted to the organisers, you know, they invited us out there for the weekend. We're going to be doing a few panels out there too. And this is a really family-focused event, isn't it? Celebrating, oh, yeah. like, video games and geek culture in general. Yeah, totally. And, you know, it's the bigger Scandinavian event, and we're going to have David Wise of Rare there, you know, he's going to be doing some performances as well. So yeah, we'll yeah. be able to hear some amazing tunes. There's also Kev Bayliss, uh, who, you know, did Banjo Kazooie, did Battletoads, all of those fantastic games. And of course, DJ Slopes as well. So this is going to be a right laugh. Yeah, all the crew are going to be out there. So yeah. we're heading over to Norway at the end of June. Um, you know, like, like we said before, it's a great one to bring the family along to as well. I mean, there's also gaming and comics and that kind of stuff too. It's going to be gaming tournaments there as well. They're actually going to be having the Neo Geo World Tour Season 2 there. So you can qualify for the global final in like stuff like Kings of Fighters 98. And there's also going to be the classic Tetris World Championship there as well. And also we will be in Dusseldorf as well for Amiga Germany. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's yeah, really good. Yeah. That's they're, they're back at playing. That's just like, oh God, <laughs> more events. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we have got a crazy year coming up. I mean, in terms of retro game events, but we love doing these, don't we? Oh, yeah. You know, there's nothing better, honestly. We love doing the podcast every week and we appreciate everyone that listens. But, there, you know, there's just such a buzz. When we're at events and people come over and the shaky hand go, we listen every week, Dan Ravi. The buys a couple of beers. That always goes down well as well. But it is always <laughs> awesome to meet people. So if you're going to come along, if you are anywhere in the Norway area or you can get there, it's going to be happening at the end of June. If you want to book tickets, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, of course, the Retro Hour podcast does come out every single week. You know, we bring you all the, the latest in retro gaming news that we'll be talking about in just a moment. And also, we bring you a special guest each week. Now, one thing that was so prevalent back in the day was the Playground Wars. You know, whether it was Commodore versus Sinclair or whether it was, you know, Amiga versus Atari or Sega versus Nintendo, those 16-bit console wars were just brutal. Yeah, and I I would say Sega and Nintendo were the biggest out of all all of them, kind of. It was a brutal war, that was. And we have Blake J. Harris on the show, who's the actual writer of Console Wars. Now, we had Tom Kalinske, who was CEO of Sega of America on, and he was telling us about the kind of Wars between Sega America, Sega Japan, yeah. <laughs> and Nintendo. So we're going to get all the details. And this this is a fantastic book. It's actually been bought by Seth Rogen, and it's going to become a Netflix series. So this is going to be huge. I mean, you, you're right there as well, because when we had Tom on, that was one of the interesting things about that interview, I thought, that, you know, back in the day, you always thought, yeah, you know, it's Sega versus Nintendo. But actually, there's a hell of a lot of infighting, particularly at Sega, you know, between the Japanese oh, and yes, the Oh, yes, and I think Blake's interviewed more people in Sega than anybody else has. You know, he's got a lot of the Japanese guys as well, which kind of, we never hear that perspective, because it's either not translated or it's not been told. Yeah, and especially with Nintendo too. I mean, they're, you know, we haven't done a lot of shows with people from Nintendo because they're infamously a very hard company to kind of get inside or they yeah. don't do much PR yeah. and they don't talk to you know podcasts and books and that kind of thing. But Blake, he's really got there on the inside. And like you said, you know, this book's been so big. 
And, you know, the fact that Seth Rogen, you know, got on board and Tom Kalinske's on board with the project Yeah, and he's, well. he's doing a new title on virtual reality as well, which sounds really exciting. Yeah, so we're both big fans of the book and, you know, we can't wait to get him on. He's going to be coming on. Talking about the 16-bit console wars, Blake J. Harris is our guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now, before we get into the news, let's just give a big thank you to you for supporting this podcast. Now, we do come out every single week and the only reason we can do that is, honestly, thanks to your support, guys. Um, we are, you know, mainly listeners donated that's how we pay for all our costs and everything so if you'd like to make a donation into the show any amount at all it all really helps out and of course you will earn your place in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming you'll find your place on the retro hour hall of fame now this week we want to say a big thank you to mark slurrance robert anderson Oscar Jacobson and Kevin Lee who all made donations into the running of the show and if you'd like to do the same honestly it's so easy we've got a little supporters section uh, top of our website you can donate via PayPal and like I said 100% of what we get will go back into the running of the show and also this week let's give a big thank you to the company and the game that have been sponsoring the Retro Hour throughout April. Now, this is this incredible new retro wrestling game, and it's brought to you by our friends at Retrosoft Studios. Now, this company are really cool. The idea is they put a retro spin on modern games. And we do love that when you get a game that kind of harks back to the old days, but it kind of does stuff that wasn't possible back then. Yeah, it keeps those old graphics, but it adds all the cool new stuff. Absolutely. And this is a game called... Retromania Wrestling. Now, if you've got your web browser open, maybe listening to us in the, you know, the next tab or you're on the train or the bus and you've got your phone handy, open your web browser right now. Just quickly tap this in for us. RetromaniaWrestling.com. Now, that is their website. This game is in development right now and you can get a little look at it, a little early glimpse of it, see what those graphics look like. And this is, when I mean, you might be looking at it, getting an instant flashback to WrestleFest. That, of course, was that massive arcade game back in the early 90s. And this is, I mean, you know, we, we were chatting about this last week, that Mike, the guy behind this, it, it was always his dream to make a sequel to the game that he grew up loving. Yeah, and he's added extra things in there. Like I, I saw screenshots of cage matches. Yeah. That looks awesome. <laughs> and there's even, you know, one-on-one -on -one matches, tag team matches in there as well. And there's going to be 12 to 16 playable wrestlers at launch. And we've mentioned a few of these, you know, he's got some big names in there. Hawk and Animal of the Road Warriors, Tommy Dreamer got announced the other week as well. Austin Idol's going to be in there. And the thing about this is, you know, it's a game that you can pick up and play, just like in the old days. Amazing 2D sprites. Gorgeous backgrounds, really fast-paced arcade game-style gameplay. So if you want to have a look at this, have a look on our website at theretrohour.com or check theirs out, retromaniawrestling.com, and follow them on Twitter at Retrosoft Studio. Now, did you work in an office back in the day, Ravi? Uh, yeah, I did. And none of them looked as cool as this. <laughs> yeah, no one worked in an office as cool as this. Now, this is Adobe, who, uh, you know, every year, kind of these big companies like Adobe and Microsoft and all that, they kind of put on, like, summits around the world where, you know, people come along to learn about their new development and that kind of thing. Well, they've actually done one in Las Vegas at the end of last month. And to kind of show how great Adobe technology is today and how incredible the 21st century is with everything being done in the cloud, they've actually recreated... Um, not quite the typical office of the 1990s, but, you know, a very exaggerated version of it. Yeah, I think they've crapified it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a Furby on the shelf, for yeah. example, overlooking you while you're working. But you look at it, and in this office... It doesn't quite match to me, mate. Uh, like uh, Apple II and a Furby. Yeah. Well, that's an Apple, an Apple SE, I think, a Mac Macintosh SE they've got there, which, yeah, was, you know, that was very early 90s, and a Furby was like, what, about 95, 96? So, yeah, I mean, it's not 100% period correct. but. They've actually worked with some big teams on this. <laughs> the crew behind Westworld and Game of Thrones experience at South by Southwest have actually got involved to help them build this. So the idea is they invited all you know, the people who have shown off the Adobe stuff to and the developers and everything to come along and try doing an advertising campaign using this vintage 90s technology, complete with floppy disks and roller decks as well. So the idea was you had to come along and make a banner ad for Pizza Hut. Okay. And then you would put, like, you know, some presentations onto a VHS tape. You'd have to fax through information. You'd have to load stuff up from a floppy disk. You'd have to go into another room that was sounds like... Sounds like heaven. <laughs> I think it sounds awesome. Yeah. The idea of this is to prove how bad it was, though. And then you'd have to go through and put a VHS tape in and uh, sit in this typical ad agency room showing them this demo. So, you know, they're really trying to prove how much easier technology is today by showing how crap it was back in the 90s, essentially. But like you said... I'm looking at this thing and I'd love to spend like the weekend in there. Yeah, I think this office is far too colourful. Like yeah. stuff was beige <laughs> and bad off colours of cream. 
There was also those cork boards everywhere. There's hardly any cork. I can't see any cork here. <laughs> yeah, and they've got a, a guy who's meant to be an ad exec, I imagine, in a bright pink suit. He wouldn't be allowed in the building to dress yeah. like that, would he? Maybe in the 80s, not today. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, I mean, one thing that I, I was looking at here is, a little quiet I thought was a bit weird. What they've done is, it's not actually the original machines that they've got. They've gone through all the computers and gutted them, put in modern motherboards in there, and oh. it's all running via emulation. And the, re- the reason they've put this in is, get this quote here, Computers from the 90s are unreliable, and you can't really find any that actually work how we wanted them to. It would have been easier for us to load it up from floppy disks, but 90% of the time floppy disks don't work. So we had to rework all the technology to get it to do what we wanted. So we do hear about this all the time, though, don't we? You know, I've just had a thought. Maybe it's because we saw boring British beige officers, and the American ones might have been... A lot more stylish and glam. You know? Yeah, I mean, an office in California in 1995 might look different from one in Hull, for example, yeah. I imagine. So, I mean, look, having a great 90s time warp. It, apparently, they might be taking this around the world at other summits as well, because it's a great bit of novelty. But um, I, I'm not sure it's actually had the effect that they wanted it to. I imagine they wanted it to be a bit of fun, but they wanted to like show how bad it was. But everyone's looking at it thinking, wow, that looks cool. If they bought it here, it'd be like, oh, there's two guys sleeping in there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to check out the pics, I'll shove them in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And we had John from Cordwell on the show a couple of years ago. He's obviously very big on the, the Spectrum scene, isn't he? And there is this great article on Hackaday that is one of our favourite websites. And Hackaday kind of really get under the skin of retro stuff and hacking together projects and that kind of thing. And there is a project that Jonathan works on, which is called the Multi-Platform Arcade Game Designer. Yeah, so Jonathan had the game designer before arcade game designer yeah. which was a really good piece of software that actually has helped a lot of spectrum development and it's helped people get games out there a lot quicker now it looks like it's getting expanded to wider platforms yeah i mean now at the moment not only can you get spectrum games made on here amstrad cpc and acon atom are now supported too and if you want to make games on these old systems, I mean, previously you had two options, really, either machine code or basic, didn't you, on a lot of these old computers? But if you haven't seen it, it's actually a little series of videos here as well. It is, I mean, like Nesmaker that we talked about the other week. It's yeah. all point and click, drag and drop. I mean, it's got stuff in here like, you know, sprite editors and you can design backgrounds and stuff on it too. But it's cool as well because you can make one game for one system, then port it for multiple systems and have all these different releases, which actually makes it easier for people who are developing like modern titles because a lot of guys will develop a modern title and then they'll also release an old school version just to get publicity or just to kind of get people into it you know you made a really good point there though as well about the fact that you can like kind of deploy it onto different systems can you imagine like you know some like the oliver twins having this back in the mid 80s oh god yeah it would have, it would have saved them a lot of time i guess and looking at it i mean even i could make a game using this and i've got you my, my programming skills are not worth talking about at all but if you want to do you know if you do want to make games with these old systems it looks so easy and there's actually a tutorial series that he's done on youtube so uh, definitely worth a check out on uh, hackaday.com and uh, jonathan cordwell i mean he, he's done a lot for the retro community and i think i think this is a great tool i'd love more of this kind of stuff allowing us to make games for our favorite systems it's yeah awesome. yeah i i always think these kind of game creation tools are really exciting and i've always loved them i remember shoot 'em up construction kit was one of my favorite favorite i actually found a game that i made on that called um it was called space two i don't know where space one <laughs> came from but I, I found it on the on some old floppy disks in my parents attic when they were moving out like about two years ago so yeah i loaded it up it's um yeah i'm never gonna upload that anywhere <laughs> <laughs> i even did like try to do a little crack draw in deluxe paint oh yeah. lovely no one else in the world will ever see that make a video on that. <laughs> no chance now let's talk about something really cool that's been all over the mainstream media in the last couple of weeks actually and i i spotted this on reddit and i think the verge did some on it nintendo life obviously covered it too and this is an awesome picture that looks like it could have been a nintendo advert in you know circa 1990 but actually it was taken on the set of the new marvel movie that's coming out avengers endgame and this is captain america chris evans and black widow scarlett johansson sitting together looking cozy on a couch playing tetris on original game boys with a link cable that is cool because we covered game boy um, being 30 last week, last week yeah. yeah so this is totally relevant having you know the latest film stars actually sitting back and kicking with a device from 1989 <laughs> it's and there's, cool. there's no real explanation as to why they're playing on the game boy like but. 
it could could have been a member of staff or yeah. or they you know they could have bought their own Game Boys. Maybe everybody's got a Game Boy in Avengers. Who knows? You just look at it and you think how big retro is getting now. The fact that you got Hollywood stars are like kind of getting back into these classic games oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. It's it's really cool. And having a link cable as well. I mean, they haven't like you know it's not like a half job here. They've really like had to oh make yeah, they're, they're, they're properly prepared it, and you know they're, they're fighting tactically. Yeah, and do you remember how much fun playing Tetris on a link cable with two Game Boys was? Yeah, and you'd think, you know, maybe they'd get Tetris 99 and start doing it with the new version. No, they're going back old school. As if there was, it. as if I didn't need another reason to, you know, really love Scarlet Johansson. There you go. There's, there's another one. She loves Game Boys. So if you want to check out that pic, I'll show it in our show notes at the retrohour.com. Now, this is a really cool little game that um, has been getting a little bit of <laughs> coverage recently. Its website is very basic, and you know at the moment you can download it, and it's uh, it's got a few bugs, but it's getting there. And the thing about Sega, you know, we're going to talk more about Sega and Nintendo in just a moment. Is Sega really kind of respect their legacy these days? Yeah, they're they're, they're really into it, and kind of they're they're a lot more accepting than Nintendo, and I think that's really helped with their brand recently. Like the launch of Sonic Mania was absolutely fantastic because the Sonic franchise really seemed like it was lost. Yeah. And kind of having Sonic Mania made by the original fan group is just awesome. And this looks like it's a new fun game. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you mentioned Sonic Mania. They're obviously Christian Whitehead, and, you know, he was a big fan of Sonic, and he kind of reverse-engineered their their engine to make, you know, new games. He did, like, you know, updated versions of Sonic 1 and 2, um, Sonic CD, and then, of course, he was the guy behind, um, well, you know, the crew, led the crew who made Sonic Mania. The, I think that is the most love and outpouring that I've seen from the retro gaming community for Sega in years, when that game came out, and you could go in and buy an old school 2D Sonic yeah. game in Asda on the Nintendo Switch, for example. But that has inspired other projects as well. Now, one game, and we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, actually, that you don't seem to see on compilations anymore, and also is quite a big omission from the um, upcoming Sega Mega Drive Mini, you know, from what we've seen at the, mm. the initial game library, is Sonic 3. And, of course, you can make Sonic 3 and Knuckles if you had both games, put them together. Now, the reason that, you know, we, we've seen speculation about this, and we talked about it a couple of weeks back, that we think the reason might be because of those rumoured Michael Jackson songs. Yeah, no one wants to be associated with him nowadays, so I don't think they would even put that on. <laughs> well, I, I think it's more to do with the Jackson estate actually owning copyright on them. I think maybe Michael didn't care too much back in the day, but now mm. they probably don't want to risk, you know, well, that, the copyright that, that was Well, that was also an original thing that when it was released was the time that Michael was going through yeah. lots of initial court cases. So that may have been a, why, a reason why his name was taken off the actual game. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk, we'll talk with Blake Harris about that. He yeah. might have some in, insight on it. But that, they reckon that's one of the reasons that the game hasn't been included in recent compilations because maybe they don't want to risk copyright suit, you know, suits and all that kind of stuff, which makes sense. But that does kind of open the door for fans to do their own versions of it. So cool. that gets us to this story. A great new fan-made recreation of Sonic 3, uh, which is called Sonic 3 Air, Angel Island Revisited. And... There are videos on this. It looks incredible. And you can actually download it and play it yourself. So it's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's the original game, like you remember it. But the graphics have kind of been, you know, made high resolution and stuff too. But they've also got stuff in here as well. He's, he's kind of improved it. And he's taken some of the best bits. For example, the drop dash from Sonic Mania. Oh, beautiful. That's in there as well. Um, there's time attack mode too. And a lot of stuff that fans love from the recent 2D Sonic games have been implemented in here. And there's also stuff like, you know, camera options and various forms of control borrowed from the original game and Mania 2, difficulty settings, region switches. You can change your layouts as well, play different characters. So he's done a hell of a lot with this, and it looks like a really, you know, complete experience if and you're a fan of the original game. this is a full game for free as well. Yeah. So you can just download it straight away. He's got a direct link. Yeah, this is awesome. On a website that looks like it could have been made in like 1994. <laughs> but it looks a bit very, very old school HTML 1.0. Um, it is a little bit buggy, but it's a beta at the moment. And if you want to try it out, like we said, it is completely free. And you just know Sega will leave this up. I, I don't think Sega are going to have a problem yeah, with it. Yeah, like uh, I remember when Sonic Mania came out, there was Sonic Time Twisted. Yeah. And that was awesome. That was a really good fan game because you'd 
like flip through different time periods and stuff. So there's some really good kind of Sonic builds out there. I was reading the other day that someone's actually ported um, Mario to the Commodore 64, like a really <laughs> faithful port of the original. No, but as soon as that made column inches, I just thought, you know, that's probably going to be up 24 hours. As soon as it gets any attention, it's yeah, gone. That's the thing. Well, that is a difference between Sega and Nintendo today, um, which is going to lead us quite nicely into our interview in a moment. We're going to get the differences between those companies back in their heyday, back in the early 90s. So more on that in just a moment. Now, before we get into our chat with Blake Harris, uh, just to remind you that the Retro Hour podcast has been brought to you all throughout this month by our very good friends at Retrosoft Studios. Now, um, honestly, thank you so much for your support because this game looks incredible. And they're bringing out a game called Retro Mania Wrestling, which is you know a bit of a throwback to WrestleFest that came out back in the early 90s with a new roster, new mechanics, new game modes included, 12 to 16 playable wrestlers at launch, 2 to 8 player local multiplayer, one-on-one -on -one matches, tag team, battle royale, all included in this game too. It's in development right now, but please do have a look at it. Support our sponsors because they've supported the podcast, RetromaniaWrestling.com, or follow them on Twitter at Retrosoft Studios. Right, let's get into the 16-bit console war with this week's special guest, Blake Harris. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's special guest, the man behind the console wars. Welcome to the Retro Hour, Blake Harris. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me on. It's uh, nice to be here. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, um, we are going to get into the console wars. You know, Ravi and I were saying before, probably the most brutal console wars of all time back in the 16-bit era. Um, but it would be quite interesting you know, to find out a bit about you. I mean, wh which kind of side of the console war did you fall on as a kid? Oh, yeah. So I'm 36 years old, and so I grew up in the, in the heat of this battle. Um, and so, you know, before I was a, the author of Console Wars, I was a, a child warrior in this metaphorical <laughs> battle. I was So for me, um, like so many households in the United States, basically I think it's like 30% of households, uh, you know, my brother and I, we had an 8-bit NES. And so we loved Nintendo. My, you know, my favorite thing to do was to play Mario, Mario 2, Mario 3, Zelda, um, Blades of Steel, all sorts of stuff. And so uh, I guess now it would have been, it must have been, you know, around Hanukkah time of 1991 yeah. uh, or, you know, leading up to the holiday season. And my brother and I, we uh, put together whatever, you know, sort of the PowerPoint equivalent uh, for, a, you know, a child's equivalent of a PowerPoint presentation for our parents of like how we needed to get the Super Nintendo and how, you know, we'd combine our Christmas and Hanukkah and birthday and all these gifts and whatever. Um, but my parents said no, which was based solely on the fact that the Super Nintendo was not backwardly compatible. Um, and, you know, they, they were not alone in feeling that way. Um, so we were not allowed to get a Super Nintendo, and we did end up getting a Sega Genesis, and so I was I ended up being on the Sega side of that battle, uh, which was, was certainly probably for the best uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one that being that it ultimately led to this book, but also uh, I always loved sports games most of all, and sports games definitely were better on the Genesis. So in England, we had kind of lots of different computer systems and consoles, yep. and we'd always have a kid with a really bizarre system. Um, did you <laughs> did you guys have kind of just Sega and Nintendo straight away, or was there any of these strange guys with weird systems? <laughs> well, you're always going to have weirdo guys with systems. Um, but it, it's interesting um, because, you know, a sort of obviously like a, a premise for my book and doing press for it all these years is talking about how before this battle between Sega and Nintendo, in which Sega was the David in this David and Goliath battle, Nintendo was David in their own David and Goliath battle in, in resurrecting the video game industry. And and people always sort of, I feel like, look at me like, well, but no, video games are such a force, like, you know, someone would have resurrected them eventually. But, but it's not necessarily true. Uh, I mean, interactive games, sure. But in terms of console games, because I think that what you guys had over there was much more of what would have happened if not for Nintendo. Um, where it was just so much more PC gaming. Yeah. And I, I can understand, yeah, we wouldn't need to devote, you know, two or three hundred dollars to a system that played only games, but you could actually have for a thousand dollars this thing that did your tax you know, had Microsoft Excel and spreadsheets and word processors. So it's not that unreasonable. Um, which I guess is all a long winded way of avoiding your actual question. Because I don't remember any friends having really weird systems. The the one I used to think was weird was the Master System, you know, the 8-bit Sega system, um, which I, I my friend uh, or my babysitter, Michael Cavey, had, which I just thought was so weird, but he was older than me, so that made him cooler, and so I really liked Alex Kidd. <laughs> See, the Master System was quite a big system here, you know. I, I didn't knew a lot of kids at school who had it, but and it wasn't the case in America, was it? No, it really wasn't. 
I guess to the basically to my my parents point like you know they wouldn't get us the Super Nintendo but they're willing to get us the Sega Genesis if they had known that there was a master system and that the Genesis games weren't um you know that the master system games weren't compatible they probably would have said the same thing but people didn't even really know it existed here well what are some of your kind of fondest childhood memories of um Sega and Nintendo and the games that you used to love well, I love the question because, you know, I remember uh, when I first started working on the book, which now was probably like seven years ago, that I used to describe it to my uh, my now wife, my girlfriend at the time, as like it's, it was almost like the uh, the the upbeat version of the JFK assassination in the sense that anytime you mentioned I was mentioned I was working on Sega Nintendo, everyone knew where they were the day that they got it, or you know what they it always brought back memories to mind, and that was such a big part of what made this story fun to research and write that everyone, you know, I, the people bring a lot of nostalgia to the book that I don't even think is really in there, but just there's so many memories associated with this time period, and 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 I'm you know no exception. Uh, you'll notice that I probably already said we or mentioned my brother like four times already and growing up um i was two years older than my brother but i was a terrible older brother i i really didn't like him because he was he was very nice and i wasn't and so everyone really liked him and so but but video games uh specifically sega nintendo era games were like the only thing that that we did together somewhat civilly um and and so many of my fondest memories are playing nhl 94 or joe montana football with my brother for listeners uh, who grew up with the internet, it might be strange to, to think of a time where there was information was so hard to get, um, like walkthrough guides didn't really exist, but what did exist was Nintendo Power. So I remember a few times getting um, some issues to Nintendo Power that had secrets to Legend of Zelda, which was one of my favorite games that my brother and I would play and, you know, figuring out how to get the raft or how to get um, the ladder, um, you know, unlocking those sorts of achievements uh, with the helps of strategy guides. It was just, it was there was so much mystery to it, you know, like er, there was not much difference between urban legend and, and actuality because you didn't know there was no internet to check up and say, you know, is there some sort of, uh, you know, uh, let's say gun that you can get in Zelda. Didn't seem reasonable, but I heard that there was a gun you can get that could kill any enemy. Did, didn't exist. So I think that just, just, just the exploring, the exploratory aspect of playing games on 8-bit and 16-bit era with my brother was are, are many of my fondest memories. Yeah, and you brought back a great memory then as well about, you know, being in the playground and you'd hear that, you know, if you did this on the summit, the hedge of title screen, like, you know, upside down. Yeah. Stuff, and like, you know, <laughs> would that really work? And you'd write it down, you'd go home and you'd be like, wow, it was it was all word of mouth, a lot of it, wasn't it, in that pre-internet era? Yeah, and, and like, like hearing that there was a gun that you can get in Zelda, that sounds really stupid. But you know what? Hearing that doing up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start in Contra would get you 30 lives also sounded kind of stupid. But somehow that actually worked. <laughs> so you had to you had to try everything. Um, and yeah, there was it was like 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 you said, like the schoolyard aspect was, was such a big part, uh, such a big part of my memories too. the the rivalry, so to speak, between Sega and Nintendo. And then also just. The like, did you hear aspect or, you know, my cousin allegedly did this thing or got to this level or figured out this glitch. Um, and it was really fun to try to figure it out, which, which is which is certainly not um, just specific to video games. You know, uh, as much as I love Netflix and other streaming services, I do sort of miss that idea of going to Blockbuster Video or a rental store. And, you know, that that exploratory discovery process of, of searching for things without much knowledge, which is maybe uh, silly because it's hard to argue that more more knowledge and information is a bad thing, but but it does seem to be uh, symptomatic of of how myself and a lot of people remember that time period, just that you know that aspect of discovery. I mean, talking about the book, the you know console wars, which you know has obviously been a massive title over the last few years. What kind of inspired you to write it originally? I mean, I was reading that you had some kind of um, encounter in Barnes and Noble when you were trying to find these <laughs> yes. history books about video games yeah so my background is is such that i i played video games a lot on the 8-bit and 16-bit era i got a sony playstation mostly used that for sports games nfl game day was my favorite thing to play and then and then from that era pretty much until my mid-20s i didn't really play video games all that much uh, and it's largely because i was always terrible at first person shooters and that's you know a large part of what the industry became or at least the kinds of games that like my friends in college would play um and so for me i i really did feel like an outsider to the video game industry um and so before i even set out to write console wars i just sincerely wanted to read like a book like console wars my favorite books to read 
as an adult are behind the scenes business stories, so, you know, making of stories, right? Like right before uh, this, this conversation, I was reading the behind the scenes story of how Seinfeld happened. You know, I love reading behind the scenes stories of how these things that we all know and love came to be. And so I went to a Barnes and Noble on 86th Street in Manhattan. It's this gigantic store. I think it's the biggest one in the city. And I, I thought that surely they would have plenty of books about Sega and Nintendo, or at least about the history of video games, the business of video games. And I was surprised to learn that they didn't have a single book in the entire store. Mm. And they didn't even do that thing where they try to, you know, sell you on, oh, we can order it for you, which is always weird because I can order it myself. Uh, but, you know, there was nothing like that. And I thought that was very odd. And, and, and I can't say that I left Barnes & Noble that day thinking like, aha, I'm going to write a book so that there will be such a book. But, but it, you know, it set me off on that path, reaching out to former employees of Sega and Nintendo. And then eventually um, I was introduced to Tom Kolinsky, who you guys had on the show and who you now know firsthand is, is just one of the greatest guys ever. Um, and, and then after speaking with him, I was very certain that there was an incredible story here and that I wanted to spend the next several years of my life, of my life uh, researching it and writing it. So why did you choose to write it in a kind of novel uh, rather than a just historical content? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think that I, there was no moment early on where I said, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. It was certainly a gradual process. But um, but there were, there were a few factors that made me feel that way. You know, when I wrote the, uh, like the original outlines and the treatment to share with my literary representatives and that, you know, stuff that I even sent to people like Tom Kalinske or Al Nielsen or Peter May or Howard Phillips, uh, you know, it was more of an encyclopedic sort of document. But then after um, I started interviewing these people and really getting to know them, so much of what appealed to me about the story, and I think that why so many of them remembered that time period as fondly as they did was because of what it felt like on a day-to-day -day basis, that energy, that excitement, and I really wanted to find a way to capture that. So in terms of sort of like the novelesque novel aspect, that was a part of it. And then the other part of it, too, was um, just the importance of capturing the different perspectives, which I think that uh, most nonfiction doesn't, you know, uh, I, I wanted readers to feel like they were in the room and in the minds of these people. And that really sort of crystallized for me as important during uh, an early meeting that I had with Olaf Olofsson, who was the uh, head of Sony and sort of the perspective of Sony in the book. And, and you know, prior to the creation of the Sony PlayStation and Sony getting into the hardware, uh, they really truly were just a, a publisher, you know, like Acclaim or Konami or, uh, I mean, obviously not as successful as those companies, but, mm. and, and, and I remember sitting at Olaf's office, um, in New York here and, and something around during that meeting clicked for me that, that, that this story really was a lot like the, the books, the game of Thrones book series, the, you know, song of ice and fire where, um, Every character, every company sort of believes that they are the chosen ones. Sega believes that, that they deserve to be the you know market leader. Nintendo believes that Sega is a bunch of frauds and they deserve to be the market leader. And Sony has their own opinion. And, and none of them are wrong, per se. It's all just a matter of different perspectives and different philosophies. And so I thought that really getting into the heads of these people was the best way to show what corporate battle is all about and, and also – like the way that you motivate yourself, um, you know, I don't think Sega would have succeeded if they didn't have Nintendo to go after. Um, and so in the sense that I hope that this book um, is not just dramatic and compelling, but I hope that it's sort of inspiring to people who are starting small businesses or, or you know, working at underdog companies, like the way that you can sort of motivate yourself. So, so bringing that energy to the forefront, um, I thought was really important. And I'll say that like as you're as you're probably aware, you know, Console Wars the the book has done quite well yeah. and generally got positive reviews. But there were some people who had very very negative things to say about it, and it usually was related to the the style that I chose to tell the story in. So coming into writing my second book, I I did give a lot of thought to whether I had made a mistake, whether I should. Um, you know, write a little bit uh, of a drier story or, or more encyclopedic. Um, and then I, I came to believe that that, that that wasn't a good decision, that that would be sort of an insult to those that I was writing about, that they deserved to have the most accessible story, the one that really captured the spirit of what it was like, and that, you know, me worrying about negative reviews from a handful of people was a bad reason not to do that. 
Yeah, and it worked for me as well. Cause, I mean, I, I listened to the audiobook version of it, and um, I went, when I was on on a trip, actually, and you know, I got through the whole thing in, in, in less than a week. But it was um, the, the fact that you know you did dramatize some of it, and it kind of got your imagination working and really put you in that place as well. And like you said, I know the style did divide reviewers, but I, I thought it really you know made it feel real. I thought. Yeah, I mean, like I did. I, I mentioned that I didn't. It wasn't like a, a conscious decision that I specifically made early on. It was more gradual. But it also, I should mention, it, it very much was a decision. It's not like I fell into it. Um, it, it. I made a decision for a lot of reasons. And it just always struck me as a little odd. Like, I, the, you know, probably one of the worst reviews of the book that stands out to me is I think it's from The Telegraph. And the headline is Console Wars Feels Hideously False. Um, and I just remember sharing that with Tom Kalinske and Al Nilsson and others that were the story was about. And they just were like saying like as they had said for months like wow like you totally captured what it was like to be at sega and all these things and so it was just weird the juxtaposition between the people who actually were there and who could say whether it was false or not and saying that it felt so true versus someone reading the book and saying it felt false but like at the end of the day i feel like that criticism while i disagree with it i don't think it's it's a bad one it did i I like the kinds of questions that it made me ask myself and i think these are good questions for journalists to ask uh, especially nowadays when there's so much, such a lack of trust um, with with journalism and for probably pretty good reasons. Um, but and then the, other, the other thing I really like too is, you know, you mentioned how quickly you got through the book. Uh, I, I did notice that even the people who seem to really dislike the book, they got through it very quickly, which I always thought of as sort of a victory because uh, most nonfiction books, you know, have a reputation for being kind of difficult to get through and kind of dry and slow. But yeah. you know, at the end of the day, regardless, I think the Console Wars is a is a pretty quick read. With such a kind of grand undertaking, how did you initially go about researching it? This might just be a habit of mine as a as a journalist to see myself in in the stories that I write. You know, to relate to characters or to relate to some of their struggles. But I do think that, kind of like Sega. I did not realize what I was getting into, and that was probably a good thing. Kind of like Tom Kalinske, you know, like I I didn't realize how big of an undertaking it was when I first started it. So um, had I known, (laughs) I maybe would have been more more, more fearful about doing it or or uh, less willing to take such a big bite. But but how I did it was um, I initially just put together like a 25-page overview of the story which was as much for me and just gathering my thoughts to see if there even was a story here as it was to share with my you know, agents and managers. And, and these were from the film side of the business where I was very unsuccessful as a screenwriter, but I at least had good representation. Um, and then that is what ended up being sent to Seth Rogen and ended up leading to uh, you know, a life-changing situation where he got involved in this project. Um, and then from there, probably the thing that really did help me structure the story and, and think about how I would actually tackle this is, is doing a book proposal. You know, my agent gave me some sample book proposals and, and, uh, you know, a big part of the book proposal for nonfiction stories, um, at least ones like this where it's events of the past. So you can sort of know ahead of time what the book is about, you know, versus sort of like the book I just did where it was unfolding in real time. Um, but you know, I, I, my book proposal was very long and, and, and very, uh, meticulously outlined. And of course, a, a significant amount of that changed while I was actually writing the book, but it at least gave me a lot of good guideposts to think about the story and to help give me some parameters while I was, you know, initially doing my research and interviews. So, you know, for a kid who grew up loving Sega, the consoles and the games, I mean, getting Tom Kalinske involved in this project, I mean, you probably, if you'd have told yourself, you know, 25 years ago that you'd be working on a project with the CEO of Sega, you'd have been like, no way, I imagine. How did you get Tom involved then? And was that like, you know, a massive score for you? Um, I would say that it should have felt the way you described it to me. But going into my first interview with Tom... You know, I, I Googled him ahead of time and I remember looking at his Wikipedia page and th- there wasn't all that much about him. Uh, I'm not going to say that I didn't know he was impressive, but like I think that that someone after reading this book will really understand why Tom was so important. And I, and I certainly didn't understand in that way, you know, who I was dealing with. And it was actually in, like sort of in the middle of my conversation with him that I realized I sort of had that moment that you're describing where it's like, oh my God, like, I can't believe this guy's talking to me. This guy's amazing. And it was even before we got to the Sega stuff, you know, I think the, our first call was about two hours and the first hour was spent talking about all the stuff before Sega, you know, with Flintstones, True Little Vitamins, and Barbie and He-Man Masters of the Universe. And, yeah. and I was just blown away. And I guess the other thing too is like as a kid, um, being 
naive and I'm maybe still naive as an adult, but, but as a kid, like it did sort of feel like these video games fell out of thin air. And, and of course that's just a childish way of looking at things, but there's also some element to that being a byproduct of, of the video game industry compared to the music industry, the film industry, like um, especially back then we didn't really talk about who the developers were, who the business executives were. So the name Tom Kalinske didn't really mean anything to me. Um, just as, as a kid, you know, the name Miyamoto probably didn't really even mean anything to me until maybe around mid nineties when Nintendo, at least Nintendo of America started talking about it a little bit more. So um, Tom was the hero I didn't know I had, and that eventually became clear to me while talking to him. And so that was a real treat, as it was in general, just to tell the stories of so many of these people that shaped my childhood and whose names I didn't know. Um, but I, I still always just remember the Wikipedia <laughs> search of Tom before I spoke to him um, and, and, and sort of not having you know basically looking at that page versus two hours after the you know two hours later after my conversation with him just thinking like oh my god this guy is the most amazing guy i've ever talked to and there's so little out there about him well how many people did you talk to about the book you know um i i, I ended up interviewing over 200 people and obviously i spoke with the principal players the main characters in the book you know several times that's why you know both my books have taken me over three years to write because they're so interview intensive um i the, the console wars was certainly tougher at first because i had no previous credits to speak with and so i guess i i had forgotten to answer your previous question about how did i even get in touch with tom um you know one of the early challenges with with writing console wars was not even getting in touch with people for a writer who had no bylines, but also just figuring out who I would want to speak with. Like there was no list that said here were the executives at Sega during this year's and here's the, you know, top devs and, and all that stuff. So getting the lay of the land first was a little bit tough, but uh, I was helped uh, a, a great deal by uh, Stephen Kent's book, the ultimate history of video games that just gave me some context for the, some of the people at Sega and, and what the landscape was like at the time. And then uh, a very useful tool for me early on was LinkedIn, and uh, which is funny because I always uh, I make fun of LinkedIn for being Facebook for work, but it really was so helpful in terms of getting uh, in touch with people from Sega and Nintendo from the 90s. And I would say that about only 15% of them replied to my request to speak, but that was... 15% of people more than I had ever spoken with before. Um, and then eventually I was introduced to Al Nilsson and I think it was through him that I was introduced to Tom Kalinske uh, in combination with a guy named uh, Travis Foz who wrote um, a really nice article for IGN about the history of Sega, which was the only article I could find out there that talked about Sega during the time period of console wars, you know, like the, during the 16 bit era. And he had a quote from Tom Kalinske in his article. And I asked Travis if he could make an introduction. He was kind enough to do so. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that right before the show, you, you, were, you were talking about how you had Tom on an earlier episode and how, you know, you, you were almost surprised that he said yes. Yeah. And I was surprised that he said yes to speak with me, um, even though I didn't know how impressive he was, but just, just, you know, cause he, he's, he's still like a, an executive, a CEO type. Um, but then, as would become clear to me in the years that followed, I guess it's not that surprising. You know, he, he taught me so much, you know, I learned so much from him about just the importance of saying yes to people who are interested in you. Um, I think that's one of the things that Sega did really well. They talked to publisher, you know, mag small magazines, big magazines, basically their barometer of whether to speak to someone or not was enthusiasm. Um, and it was, you know, it wasn't so much about like, you know, what can you immediately Return for me. I'm sure that Tom didn't care how big your audience is, whether it's a million people or one person. If you know, if you have that enthusiasm and passion, um, he's probably going to find a way to talk to you. Do you find that was a difference between you know approaching Sega people and Nintendo people? Did you find it easier to get into the the Sega world than N Nintendo? Yeah, that's a really good question and observation. I, I remember joking to my wife that that even. Uh, that that just based on the conversation with someone, I could tell whether they work at Sega or Nintendo because yeah. <laughs> their personality types were so different. That you know, that's a bit of a, an over exaggeration and, and stereotype of the two types of companies. But like, you know, 
the people at Sega made my job so easy. I would ask, you know, uh, what do you remember from, you know, like what was the first time you heard about Sonic 2? And they would just talk for 20 minutes and tell me all these stories. Whereas for maybe someone I did, I'd say, when was the first time you heard about Mario 2? They would say like, oh, September 1989. And I'd be like, okay. Uh, what, what, what do you remember hearing? Uh, I remember hearing that the game was coming out. Okay. Uh, you know, like really forcing me to ask specific questions because they just didn't think in terms of telling stories, which is I, which is how a lot, so many people from Sega thought about that time period. And yeah, like I think your question also touches on just the identities of the company. Sega, Sega was really um, affable. Um, they really made it a point to to connect with uh, retailers, with uh, journalists and developers. You know, regardless of size, and, and to really try to connect on a human level. Where Nintendo. You know, for them, it really was like all about the games, and it was uh, less about that human connection on a business level. And and I I came to respect Nintendo's approach as well, even though it's not the one that I I would go with. But I do think it's important to note that you know I, I've now been buying video games for thirty plus years, and I've never purchased a Nintendo game that I didn't think was really good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's partly because of their uh, just, just the the way that they do business. Um, you know, they 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 care about quality um, and not always don't always have the greatest bedside manner, but but it does result in in good consumer facing products. Well, Nintendo are yeah. still kind of around today in a big form, but um, Sega sure. took a big hit. Um, one of the common themes of the book is the kind of wrong moves and sometimes ignorance of Sega Japan. Were they to blame for a lot of the missteps? Yeah. So. The the scope of the book really is you know 1985 to 1995 especially you know especially the the 16 bit era I guess up until 1996 so I'm, I'm I guess what I'm trying to say is that I I'm, I'm not an expert um, on on why Sega eventually did leave the console business but I think that the book makes a really compelling case for why the writing was on the wall um, I I think that um, the Sega of Japan made a lot of missteps, though perhaps that is a matter of perspective from Sega of America. But at the end of the day, regardless, um, the, both the Sega of America and Sega of Japan were just not on the same page. There was so much friction between the both sides, and that definitely um, was not conducive to a, a long-term sustainable relationship, um, especially one where, you know, if you look at the gaming landscape now, you have um, Sony, whose money came from consumer electronics. You have Microsoft, whose money came from computer devices and, and software. Um, and then you have Nintendo, who's always been really uh, disciplined with their money. And, and, and not to say that Sega was very undisciplined, but, but the stakes of, of the game industry are so much higher now. You know, back in the console war, the 16-bit era, um, you know, it, it would cost 500000 or a million or $2 million to make a game. Now it could cost $200 million to make a game. So... Sega couldn't afford to have that friction because they didn't have the money to, um, you know, stick around in, in, in a higher stake game. So um, I, I think that anyone who gets to the end of the console wars book, uh, they, they can't be shocked to know that five years later, Sega pulled out of the console industry altogether. Well, I mean, what were like some of the, you know, when you started researching this, were there any moments that like really surprised you or any stories that you learned from like former employees or, or when researching the companies? Anything that kind of stuck out? Well, the first thing, this is more of a, a broad, not a not specific thing, but just that, like, like, like we were saying earlier, like, you know, we were kids during this time. And so talking to Tom was, would seem to be really cool or talking to people from Sega. Like, like one of my big fears going into it was going was that I was going to talk to people who worked there and they would basically tell me that, you know, it was like any other job. You know, it wasn't as cool as kids might have thought that it would be from the outside. So I was really happy to learn that. For almost everybody that I spoke with, um, both at Sega and at Nintendo, they, they looked back on this time as one of the greatest in their life, and they did think it was so much fun. So, so that was a real nice relief because, like I said, I like behind-the-scenes business stories, and a lot of times um, th there's not as much magic in the reality of, of, of the workplace as you might have uh, hoped that there would be. But, but there was that excitement and that energy and that magic at Sega and Nintendo. Um, I, I would have to say that in terms of stuff that surprised me, it was a situation where... I, I worked on this for three years, but it, but almost every day 
I would find something new. And, and I, that really did keep me very excited and motivated. Um, in terms of the big bombshells that I just had trouble wrapping my head around was some of the stuff mentioned towards the end of the book about the the next generation console that Sega could have had instead of the Sega Saturn, you know, the possibility to partner with Silicon Graphics, um, which Nintendo ended up doing and, you know, leading to the Nintendo 64. And then also um, a chance to partner with the PlayStation, which Sony obviously did on their own. Um, and just the poetic aspect of that um, in that Sega had the opportunity to work with the two companies that ended up destroying it in the end. So that was always a really big one for me. And then I loved the actual, um, I loved the sonic development stories of the character and going from, you know, the early iterations with the girlfriend Madonna and the band and the fangs and all that stuff. Um, and just seeing how Sonic came to be as well as other games that were not as popular, but that were, were popular for the system and that I loved like Toe Jam and Earl, like Echo the Dolphin, Joe Montana football, even, you know, it is a lot like, uh, like the movie industry where, where there's like a story behind every game and, and the book unfortunately only has a few of those stories in there, but, but I did get to hear a lot and I always love those stories. I also remember all the kind of marketing campaigns and they were, they were pretty extreme with the whole attitude kind of stuff coming out of Sega. Um, sure. How much of the Sega Nintendo war was kind of just purely marketing? Uh, a big part of it from Sega's perspective. I think that from Nintendo's perspective, they would say a small part of it, they would say that all that matters is the game. Um, but but from Sega's perspective, it really was about the brand and the identity. And I would say that, you know, prior to working on this book, that like most people, I had probably a negative opinion of marketing. I thought, oh, it's just like people who, in suits who make commercials. Um, and I didn't realize that marketing is more than just the advertisements. It is you know, how you feel when you, when you play a game, when you, how, how you felt in the schoolyard talking about these games. Um, and, and, it, and it definitely worked on me because um, even though it, it makes people like, like Tom Klinsky and Al Nilsson and Ellen Beth Van Buskirk um, sad every time I say it, at the end of the day, I am more of a, a fan of Nintendo games. I like, I love Super Mario. That, that is so much more my speed you know sonic is is super fast and edgy and i'm not really like that i like i like uh just wandering around the mushroom kingdom and collecting the gold coins and looking for them and um so you know personality wise nintendo was a better fit for me in terms of the games but i also was a kid and and impressionable and i wanted to be cool and i and i totally bought into the sega marketing i wanted to be a sega kid um and and so i I'm a sample size of one, of course, but I always found it interesting that, you know, it worked, if it worked on me, it, it, it certainly, I can understand why it worked on so many other people. I mean, obviously Tom's a big part of the book. I mean, you know, and the success of Sega in the, in the golden era. Um, I mean, do you think he did everything right or did Tom make some wrong moves as well? Um, great question. Um, the, to sort of the answer to the first part, you know, I, I try to challenge myself a lot while writing it to make sure that I wasn't giving too much credit to Tom, um, especially because, you know, he did not create the game Sonic, you know, Yuji Naka did that. Like, like, like um, some people might think like when you say how important Tom was that he made the games, of course he didn't make the games, nor would he ever say that he did. Um, so, so the way I sort of, uh, what I came to believe was that that Sonic would have been a success, a mild success without Tom and Sega of America. Um, but I don't think Sega would have been successful. Sega of America would have been successful without Tom. Um, and I think that that's why early on in the book, I have that chapter about the story of Tom Kalinske and his background and all the different times that he seemed to have struck, uh, you know, had seemed to have had the golden touch with He-Man and Barbie and all that, because I, at some point, it stops being a coincidence that he's always in the right place at the right time. Um, all of that said, I think it would be foolish to say that he did everything perfect. Um, I think that he had an approach that he had throughout, uh, that he's had many of the stops in his career that has usually been largely successful. Uh, but you know, th there's plenty to criticize about him. Um, if, if I, you know, I think the easiest one, the easiest criticism to make is that, um, you know, early on in, with Barbie, he talks about segmenting the Barbie line and having different dolls for different girls. You, that, that's something that Sega kind of did with, with, with hardware, you know, they had a Sega CD, 32X, Nomad, um, Genesis, Saturn, all these different consoles. Um, the problem of course is that you need software for all these different things. And so, um, taking that approach 
with in video games is a little bit more difficult. That said, I mean, what Tom did generally worked, and I think it would have worked very well if, if they had uh, had launched a next generation system that was able to compete against PlayStation and Nintendo 64. So I think that, you know, the most significant thing to me is that, that um, you know, early on in the story, Tom makes that four point plan pitch to the board of directors in Japan and is essentially laughed at and they're angry. Uh, but Nakayama san, the head of Sega in Japan, uh, you know, empowers Tom and says that this is why I hired you to follow your vision. Um, and then later on, five years later, Tom is not allowed to follow his vision. And, and that's when Sega starts to falter. So I think that Tom's track record shows that I think he deserved to, to be able to follow that out. And then the other thing too is uh, we talked earlier about how um, over there, it wasn't just Sega versus Nintendo. There was also computer games. There was also weirdo consoles and games and all that stuff. Um, here in America, it was much more of Sega versus Nintendo, and that was it. But I didn't really realize that in Japan, it wasn't even really Sega versus Nintendo. It was just Nintendo. Mm-hmm. You know, like looking at the market shares in Japan, um, Sega hardly ever uh, surpassed 15% of the 16 bit market. Um, whereas here in the United States, they they at some point surpassed Nintendo. So, you know, the only, not the only, but the biggest difference between Sega of America and Sega of Japan in their respective markets was their approach. You know, there, there was basically what I'm trying to say is that they had the same games, they had the same content. Um, so it's really a, how uh, it was a matter of how they ran their businesses as well as just other internal factors, uh, uh, other external factors like, you know, Nintendo's had more of a monopoly in Japan. But, um, but you know, I think that 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 more than anything really highlights the impact that Tom and his team made at Sake of America that they were able to surpass Nintendo here, whereas in Japan, with the same games, they they were hardly able to make a dent in the market. I mean, talking about Sega's hardware, and I think this kind of outlined, you know, one of the key differences between Sega and Nintendo in that mid-90s time was the fact that the, the Saturn, you know, seemed very rushed, that release, you know, it was straight to, straight to market. And, you know, for example, the N64 um, didn't come out here until, like, spring 1997, you know, it was over two years after the Saturn. I mean, do, do you think that was a difference between the companies, that Sega just kind of rushed stuff out there with, without as much thought? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that would be another good criticism, I think, for 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 Tom or for Sega of America or Sega in general. Um, you know, the the book is divided into five different portions, parts of the parts, and and the last one is called the Tortoise versus the Hare, which I think did sort of sum up the difference between Sega and Nintendo. Um, Nintendo was always and, and still seems to be willing to take extra time and delay games in order to finish them in the way that they want them to. Um, whereas Sega, with the hardware like the Saturn, they were much more willing to rush things out the door to hit deadlines or, you know, deadlines unrelated to the creative aspect. And you know, another good example, too, was with uh, with Sonic 3. Uh, you know, Sega, Sega of America had secured a Happy Meal deal. Yeah. Um, and so they sort of structured the game release around hitting that deadline as opposed to, uh, I have to believe that Nintendo would never do anything like that or at least would be um, much more reluctant to, to compromise the quality of the game or the release of the game. You know, Sega ended up breaking up the game into couple different games but um you know i think th- i think the like the point you're making it, it does get at one of the big core philosophical differences between the two companies and yeah, talking to sonic 3 actually we were discussing on on the show a bit earlier actually about the, you know that michael jackson rumored music that's on there i mean you kind of you know speaking to people on the inside i mean did you hear much about this and kind of any confirmation that michael jackson was involved in the music on sonic 3 uh unfortunately it has been several years <laughs> recent i wrote the book so i'm not um up to date on the I don't remember exactly what the specifics were, but but he uh, he definitely was involved with the music of the game. There was a it was, a, it was definitely a bad timing situation uh, with Michael Jackson and the allegations of um, you know inappropriate ac- interactions with children. Uh, it's 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 weird to think about that situation from the perspective of a video game company because it was obviously real people who had real traumatic experiences that are much more important than you know having to strip michael's name from sonic 3 but michael um was a big sega fan he he had the moonwalker game with them and and that that was another early on thing that i really found interesting just how um how often celebrities 
like Joe Montana or Michael Jackson were at Sega headquarters and, and how they actually did have involvement in, in the making of these games. Um, but yeah, I, I was glad to get some clarity on those long held rumors about Michael's involvement on Sonic 3. When Sony kind of entered the market, did the success kind of really take Sega and Nintendo by surprise? Um, it did, which is which is so weird because <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it kind of reminds me that that classical situation of y- you you start dating a girl who's dating someone else, and she, you know she cheats on her boyfriend to be with you, and then she ends up cheating on you, and you're kind of shocked. But you shouldn't really be shocked because you know it happened once before. That's how your relationship started. So maybe that's not a great analogy, but I was just thinking that basically Sony did to Sega exactly what Sega did to Nintendo, and Sega seemed totally unprepared and, and surprised that it could happen to them, even though. They just did it to Nintendo, who had even more reason to believe it couldn't happen to them. I think that getting back to that idea of like the tortoise versus the hare, as, as much as Nintendo under-anticipated Sega and then later Sony, they always did at least do their thing their way, that it didn't alter their plans too much. So they were caught off guard and probably could have positioned themselves better. But Sega was a much more reactive company. It hurt them even more to be caught off guard by Sony. I know the book kind of finished, you know, the, at the end of Kalinsky's time at Sega. But I mean, you know, after that, we obviously got the Dreamcast in uh, in '99, and by then, you know, the PlayStation Two was on the horizon, and you know, it just kind of seemed like as as much as the Dreamcast today is regarded as an amazing console, and it's got you know such a, a hardcore fan base. It just seemed like at that stage they they really had no chance of competing. I guess. Yeah. So again, it's it's like the kind of thing where. I wish I had more information. Like all I know is speculation and whatnot. But like the Dreamcast is one of my favorite all-time consoles, and I think it it was very popular here and it sold very well. But from what I understand, it, it you know it sold at too big of a loss that that Sega eventually had to pull the plug um, on on you know wanting to sell units and, and increase the install base, and so that was a big part of its demise. Um, so that, that that's pretty uh, indicative of a of a poorly run company when your success is the thing that drives you out of business. Yeah, I remember um, <laughs> when it came out in the UK. Um, straight away, there was a boot disc available. Yeah, like part, part like the, the day that it came out, there was a boot disc oh, available, really? and yeah. everybody was just ripping that. I think people bought about one original <laughs> title for the whole system. Um, it's a great console, though, and, it's, and it makes oh. it even sadder that Sega is not in the console business because um, it just makes you think that what could they have been doing the past 15, 20 years if they were still in the industry? Because you know, their success was unlikely, but it wasn't because what they made was didn't deserve to be successful. They, they did so many great things, and they still do. You know, they make software, but but uh, I would have loved to see them stick around even longer in the console industry because I think that they're really – I like their innovative spirit. I know we're getting the, the, the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive Mini, you know, hopefully later this year, and it does kind of seem a bit like Sega are, like, respecting their legacy and their retro titles a lot more these days and that community around it. I mean, I don't know if you've, you've noticed that too. Uh, yeah, I did notice it. You know, the book came out, what, five, five years ago. It came out in May 2014. And, and at the time, um, both Nintendo and Sega – did not have the respect uh, or or you know weren't as focused on uh what they had done in the past as i think they should have been you know i think that both companies had this mentality of you know we're not focused on the past we're focused on the future and that's sort of uh, bill belichick like you know on the cincinnati mentality um which makes sense maybe in the nfl when you have a 16 week schedule but nintendo has such a rich history and sega does as well to a smaller extent, but it's, but, it, but it really does hit that sweet spot with with people our age, um, and it's been really nice to see over the past five years as these companies have both done a better job of embracing um, that era of gaming and not seen it as a detriment, you know, taking away from the future of the company. And Nintendo, I think, has done a very good job of of leveraging that. Like what you know, Mario Maker comes to mind, where it's kind of a, a total. Um, you know, lip service to to the retro gaming, but it's with a modern twist where you can actually make your levels. So um, I, I think it's been awesome. I know it's kind of self-serving to say that because I'm <laughs> I'm exactly the generation that they are talking to um, when they when they uh, you know release these things. But it's also been great too because um, you know, like I said, I'm 36, so a lot of my friends and peers ha- you know now have young kids, and and I, my, some of my favorite stories to hear. Are stories of them playing the Nintendo Classic with their 
children and you know the child appreciating it either because the games hold up or because it comes from their parents and they can tell how much their parents like it so it's just been a really nice way to hand down those experiences yeah I mean, my little kid. nephew harry's five years old his favorite game on his switch is sonic mania you know you can't get enough of it that's yeah. awesome yeah. yeah i love that um how did seth rogan end up doing the uh foreword for the book so because you know at the um as much as i want my books um, you know, to be super accessible and fun and compelling um, and, and character driven and stories about more than just gaming. I also, you know, at their core, they're both business stories. They're both like big case studies. And, and I learned so much um, from studying Sega and also Nintendo, but largely Sega because I can relate to Sega. Sega was a no name company. I was a no name. Um, and I really learned how Sega uh, use some strategies to do more with less. And one of the things that Sega did really well was, uh, you know, align themselves with companies like Nickelodeon and MTV and with celebrities like um, Dustin Diamond and Joey Lawrence that, you know, helped elevate their brand. And so um, I, I literally Googled celebrity gamers and Seth Rogen's name came up. Um, and so I, ha- I asked my manager to send him over a copy of that treatment that I mentioned earlier, sort of like a 25 page overview. Um, and, but I also had no expectation that I would ever hear back from Seth. I, you know, I, I thought it was, it was just, you know, one approach of many that I planned to try. Um, and so it was kind of life changing when, uh, he, wanted when he liked what he read so much that he wanted to meet and then it definitely was life-changing when after a two-hour meeting with him and evan goldberg um him and uh you know seth and evan uh said that they wanted to produce a a movie based on the book which now is going to be a tv show based on the book and also to help in any other way which did end up uh, leading to them writing the forward to the book um and and so i you know i had a day job at the time that i had had for um, eight years trading commodities for Brazilian clients. I was trading sugar and coffee and soybean. And so um, it really was life changing to go from doing that to, to doing what I love full time. Well, you mentioned that, you know, originally there, there was plans for a movie and that's since turned into a TV series. Um, when can we expect that? And what, why was it changed from a movie to a d- TV series? What happened there? Well, I, I mean, I guess the shortest answer is that um, it always should have been a TV series. Um, you know, it's a 550 page book. It's, it's, it's something that I think was always going to be difficult to condense to 90 minutes or to two hours. But, um, but even back then, it, you know, we sold it to Sony in 2012. Um, you know, the, we still weren't t- fully in the golden era of television. You know, like movies were, did have a place of prestige higher than television, which I don't think is the case now. I think that both, both mediums are, you know, really well respected um and, and make sense to um do big important stories and so i guess from my perspective i always wanted it to be the longer the better um and and and, and that sort of became apparent over time because um you know in addition to the the narrative adaptation that was going to be a movie is now going to be a tv series uh my friend uh my my uh Co, my screenwriting partner Jonah Toulis and I have also been doing a documentary. Uh, we've been directing it for Seth and Evan, um, and and you know so we've had a lot of opportunities to talk about what the 90 minute version of the story looks like through that, um, and it sort of became clear that um, it probably should be longer. And now that um, that is you know people consume content more um, in that style, that you know th- that we could probably uh, have success doing it as a TV series, uh, we kind of jumped at the chance to do it that way. When and in terms of when, when we can yeah. expect it, uh, so uh, we sold it to Legendary Pictures um, in like last late last summer, um, and right now uh, we have uh, Jordan Voigt-Roberts, the director, who did uh, Kong Skull Island, and for me, he did. I love that he did the Destiny 2 commercial. He's done a lot of awesome video game-related stuff, and we have an awesome writer, Mike Rosolio, um, and Mike uh, has written a draft of the pilot that everyone's very happy with um and and so we're about to sort of move forward now and and try to find a home for the series so we should know in the next few months uh where it's going to be produced um if it's going to be produced you know there's still a chance it might not work out but but I'm, i'm very encouraged by what i've seen so far um i think the pilot script is um I'm very biased, but it's one of the best uh, scripts I've ever read. Um, I think that you know it, it captures all the fun and excitement and 
90s-ness of the book, but also it has Mike's, Mike's original voice too, and I, I liked it. Um, I feel like my, my book's in there, but, but it also really reads like his own unique special thing. Well, Blake, you've not been taking it easy. You've actually recently released another book as well called The History of the Future About Oculus, Facebook, and Virtual Reality. So what, what kind of inspired the new book? That was, uh, I, I was really interested in the Oculus story and Oculus's quest to resurrect virtual reality. And, um, and, and you'll probably appreciate this, but, but I was early on, you know, f- over four years ago, trying to figure out what I was going to write next and, and debating a, several different topics. One of the ones I was thinking about was writing about uh, Rovio, the company that makes Angry Birds, and sort of using that as a way to get into mobile gaming and talk about that. Um, but I remember being at either Comic Con or E3 in 2014, and I was having lunch with Tom Kalinske and Al Nelson um, and, and a guy named a friend of mine named Michael Kiraz. And, um, and, and Tom and Al both said, oh, I think you could do better than Rovio. And I was like, what do you mean better? They're, you know, they, it's like the best selling mobile game of all time. It's so popular. And then they're like, no, 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 you, you should do something bigger. Um, and I was like, well, guys, you know, Sega Nintendo stories don't grow on trees. And I was like, but I have been very interested in Oculus and VR. And they're like, oh, you should definitely do that. And so, uh, you know, getting their vote of confidence to, to work on the story, I think was helpful at that time. Um, and yeah, I've spent, I basically spent, the past three and a half years working on the book and it and it came out in february and uh and uh it feels crazy to be done with that that book that book took longer than console wars and also i extended my deadline by two years to finish that one so that book felt a lot like the book that would never end because it was a story that was happening in real time and because the main character of the story the the sort of the tom kolinsky of this book um got fired in the middle of the process for reasons that had nothing to do with uh business so um it, it, this was a real real different story it turned out to be it's a really fascinating subject because um in nottingham and leicester we have a virtuality which was a, a kind of commodore amiga based um old virtual reality system and even down the road from where we're recording we used to have uh in the 90s a virtual reality cafe it didn't last for long <laughs> but um yeah, yeah but i remember it i mean like i feel like I feel like if you were to have pulled me aside back in 1995 when I was what when I was 13 years old and said like, "Hey Blake, you know what's the future of of gaming going to be?" I would have said, "Oh, definitely virtual reality. Like all this stuff's happening now, and it seems like it's going to be the future." And then it just <laughs> went away. And then here we are, 20 years later, and for a period of time, it seemed like it was going to be the future again. And now it's not so sure. But you know, there's at least now great consumer devices out there so it's 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 a very interesting subject matter because it's had so many starts and stops and because for those of us who grew up in the 90s we remember how much it felt like it was right around the corner only to not be at all well blake i'll uh, i'll put a link in our show notes if uh, people do want to get hold of your new book i mean it sounds a really fascinating story in console wars of course as well and you will be keeping an eye out for the tv series it's uh it's been so good to get your story we could talk to you for another hour easily but you know uh, i appreciate you're a busy yeah, guy. Well, let's so. do it. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, th- this was life changing for me, so I love talking about it. Um, so, so maybe you'll have me back when the TV show comes out or something. But uh, thanks so much for helping spread the word. Thanks for having Tom on and helping get more of his story out there. I think he's such an important, fascinating guy. And, and yeah, thanks for having me on. This is a really nice conversation. Mm-hmm.